Hello and welcome to the video. This is my setup and overview video of these things here. These are the DJI Digital HD FPV goggles. Well, it's actually the entire system. I'm going to talk about the goggles. I'm going to talk about the air unit. This just happens to be installed in a, uh, a coppice cine whoop. I'll put a link down to the review of this particular model. Uh, but it's got the HD system in here. Uh, that's a little 3D printed uh, camera cover just to stop it getting knocked and I'm also going to talk about the DJI FPV controller as well and how the whole system goes together and again this isn't going to be a review it's uh, I'm not interested in talking about you know is it an analog killer or whatever this is aimed at all of you pilots who are maybe thinking about this or maybe you've ordered it and it's waiting to come to kind of go through my experiences I'm going to specifically talk about uh, how to set it up, what software you need to do on the computer, steps to activate and bind all this stuff together, and then uh, some tips, tricks, and a couple of mods and things to think about as well. So before we get into actually uh, going through how you set this stuff up, it's pretty straightforward actually, uh, but I was one of those people, I wanted to watch someone else do it and to talk about everything. Uh, this stuff has now been out, it came out in August 2019, so it's been kicking around for quite a long time. Now the goggles have a ridiculously large field of view, they support both 16.9 and 4.3, and the field of view in these is about 85 degrees. Now that for some pilots is just too much, and it is a very immersive big screen. It's kind of like looking at an IMAX screen versus a regular cinema screen. And that nice high resolution image, I think it's 1440 by 810, um, provides a beautiful image along with the camera system. Um, but be aware of that really big field of view. If you're coming to these and you're using fat charts or something else, then when you come onto here and, and get that bigger field of view, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, 16.9 for altitude and flying things like fixed wing, I'll talk about fixed wing in a minute, is really, really immersive. 4.3 is still, in my opinion, better for flying things like multi-rotors, where when you're kind of cranked over, you're going to be flying around. There is an SD card in here, so you can record the flight both here and in the airside unit as well. Uh, and interestingly, the way the antennas work is uh, a little bit unusual. Only the top two antennas actually receive and transmit. It's talking to the airside unit all the time. Uh, these two at the bottom are just there to receive. So you can replace these with patch antennas and get a much better signal uh, in a slightly narrower range of the sky. These are all left-hand polarized antennas on here. So they are a little bit unusual when you are coming from a traditional analog side and you're a right-hand polarized pilot like I am. Next thing to talk about then is the air unit. Uh, the air unit, there's a big silver box that has the SD card, that has the connector at the back where the cable plugs into. That cable has a power and ground. It also has things like a, a UART connection and it also has things like an RC out. So if you're using the next thing we're going to talk about, one of these, uh, the airside unit can replace both the receiver and the video transmission system and it all goes together and works nicely. MMCX connectors for the two antennas. The two antennas are little dinky things. In this particular model, they're kind of stuck out here. There are also third-party licensed units starting to come out now that uh, have a slightly different configuration. But again, these are left-hand circular polarized antennas. Field of view is pretty big on the camera as well, which is why for some pilots, the 16.9 mode is just uh, a little bit too wide. CMOS center in here, and again, a little SD card inside the air unit so you can record locally so if you do get a little bit of breakup on uh, on the goggle side you have a nice clean recording of the video last thing to talk about is this part of the system this is one that i haven't seen as many videos on uh, this is the dji uh, fpv controller um, it works really nicely with the rest of the system but then it kind of all supposed to isn't it you actually bind it with the air side unit and then you actually configure everything through menus in the goggles. So if you don't have the goggles, then this is gonna be an absolute mare to set up. Uh, removal battery, USB-C at the bottom, um, and it's pretty basic to be honest, and it's incredibly heavy for a remote control. Um, and uh, when you turn it on, as with all DJI products, 
there's a big fan starting so if I press and hold the button to power it on I'll put it by the mic it makes that noise pretty much all the time so I press and hold the button press and hold it again the uh, lights at the bottom are for the battery level and then you have kind of the st status connection LED on the left uh, red when it isn't connected and green when it is so a couple of comments about this stuff. There has been uh, a slowdown in the amount of updates. Not sure whether that's because the firmware is getting a little bit more sorted now or whether the coronavirus is having an impact on DJI's ability to keep up with all the fixes and changes that are needed. Uh, the fit on the goggles is terrible. The way it actually goes onto your face isn't great and there's a huge gap um, around the side. Uh, there is optional foam that you can buy. It's a £14 uh, piece. Um, or you can kind of buy, you know, third-party shims and things to go in the side to kind of bring these in a little bit so it fits a little bit better on your face. If you squidge it in, um, then you can kind of get rid of a lot of the light leaks. But out of the box, um, it's not a great fit. So if you're buying these and uh, you don't have... As kind of a breeze block of a face then it's worthwhile investing in the other foam. The air unit does get a lot hotter than I expected even running at the UK legal 25 milliwatt power levels uh, if you are using another region or you unlock it to access the higher powers and again be careful that's not legal in an awful lot of places it gets very hot indeed. Now inside a model like this uh, it's actually carefully designed so that the pretty decent amount of airflow around it to try and keep it cool um, and it manages the heat reasonably well there are also other air units available licensed by dgi that have a different mounting so you can actually put them on top of a flight controller stack but what that means is that if you're going to put this inside something like an fpv wing i would probably put this right at the front um, probably where the opening for something like an action camera would be and have the antennas stuck out the front of the wing like the uh, like the antennas of something like a butterfly and that way you'll get enough airflow over it to keep it cool and uh, stop it overheating because normally with a VTX I would usually put it inside a wing in the middle uh, I'm going to potentially do a wing build with this stuff and I'm just not happy about having that much heat contained inside and it just wouldn't be kept cool enough as I mentioned, the airside unit is actually quite a clever little bear. It's connecting to both the radio and the goggles and sending both the RC control pieces to the flight controller as well as the FPV back to the goggles. So this is kind of the heart of the system and you can uh, bind multiple air units to multiple goggles and controllers. Setup is simple. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in the online manuals. And uh, I'll go through that in a second. The binding is relatively straightforward, but first you have to activate it and then update the firmware on all of these. Uh, keep an eye on the firmware updates. They do introduce new functionality. Again, all of the setup for the radio is done through the goggles. So you have to have both powered on. Uh, you kind of press uh, this button here briefly when the system is powered. This one here, this little roller. There we go, camera's caught up and the menu appears in the goggles and you can set things like the direction, uh, the trim levels and the switch assignment as well. Uh, so that does mean that once you've got it set up, it's all working and it's a little bit weird when you first come to the system to have to kind of have your goggles on to just change how everything works. There isn't a way at the moment to add things like Expo and stuff, which I would have liked on the radio for things um, like different flight modes and stuff. Uh, this is definitely more aimed at the multi-rotor part of the market, I think. Uh, but then if you're using a flight controller inside your wing, then I guess that's going to be fine too. Sadly, no HDMI out of the goggles. Um, the next firmware update looking at it is going to allow you to pair this with the smart radio or the smart controller. Uh, the smart controller is horrendously expensive as well and that will give you HDMI out. Brilliant. It should have been on the goggles. There should be some way to get an AV out. Now this is a USB 3 connector. Um, hopefully uh, that may be the wired it up so you can get an AV out. Uh, it would just be nice when you're flying to have some way for your buddy to plug their goggles in via a standard AV feed or even a HDMI cable and actually watch what you're doing. Um, you can't do that yet. And I think that was a massive oversight by DJI not putting HDMI, 
um, HDMI out on these goggles straight out of the box. A couple of last things before I show you how to set them up. Uh, the OSD is created inside the goggles. I did a video on this a while ago um, talking about why the iNav on screen display isn't great. It's all around the Betaflight MSP multi wee serial protocol. What happens is the telemetry is sent from the flight controller to the air unit, goes over the air into the goggles and the goggles hears that telemetry information and then creates the on-screen display um meh the on-screen display is fine it you know you can kind of use it for what you need if you're something like me an inav pilot or potentially you want to have an on-screen display with something like mavlink then it isn't supported right now um, i hope it is soon because that is a severe limitation of the goggles and it's a firmware or software thing hopefully that will be updated and the last point I'll make, and something that I don't think has been talked about enough, is on the legal power levels, 25 milliwatts here in the UK. Unfortunately, it means that your maximum, you're going to get about 0.7 kilometers away uh, in ideal conditions. Now, again, you can upgrade the two antennas at the bottom. Uh, Menace RC have uh, an antenna kit that they've brought out that you can replace these, and that will give you twice the sensitivity. Uh, which hopefully will increase your range a chunk. Uh, but even so, on 25 milliwatts, it's not great. It was interesting to see when these first came out, everybody that was going, they're amazing, we're flying at higher power levels in places like America. If you want to be legal and stay at 25 milliwatts, um, you're only going to be able to fly around the local park and reasonably close in for safety as well. So with all of the antennas connected to both the goggles and snaps into the back of the air unit it's time to activate and update it now uh, do make sure that you do have all the antennas installed you are going to be powering this stuff on it will kind of ish work if you don't activate it but it won't allow you access to all the menu system and, and everything isn't properly turned on so the first thing you need to do is go and find and download the DJI Assistant 2 and install that onto your computer because that's the thing you need to have along with a DJI account which you can set up through the app or on the DJI website in order to activate all this stuff and get it working. Now what you need to do is to power the goggles, uh, just plug in a 3S or a 4S LiPo. When it's all powered on, plug in the USB cable in the port at the bottom and then plug it into your computer. Now with mine, it uh, had to install the drivers the first time. It took a minute or two to do that. Um, and then when it had finished, it still didn't appear in the DJI Assistant. So if that happens to you, don't worry, just unplug the USB cable, count to 10, plug it back in and it'll appear. Now there isn't an awful lot of stuff in the DJI Assistant 2 program that you can actually change. And it's only when you have it plugged in that if it's the first time, it'll tell you, do you want to activate it? And you have to accept all the terms and conditions. Uh, I'd have a quick scroll through them, make sure that you're not promising anything that you don't want to give away. And then once it's activated, which takes a handful of seconds, then it will prompt you to do a firmware update. Uh, again, lots of terms and conditions, click accept, OK, and then the update will start. The update will take five, six minutes, only uh, about that much. It's nowhere near as long as something like a Mavic or one of the other uh, pieces of DJI technology. Uh, make sure the battery is fully charged so it's going to be powered for the entire time. Once it's finished, it'll shut down. It'll actually reboot a number of times during that update. Just leave it alone until it says it's complete, and that's the goggles done. Similarly, with the airside unit, I updated and activated my airside unit to make sure it was okay before I installed it into the model. And I used this little cable here, uh, just soldered an XT60 cable onto the power wires and went through the same process. Again, power it from the battery, plug it in via the USB cable that you get supplied as part of the kit into your computer. It'll appear, it'll ask you to activate it, then go through the firmware update. Again, it takes about the same amount of time. And once that's finished, the airside unit's done too. And finally, guess what? It's exactly the same with the radio. Uh, the USB port is at the bottom, so you're going to plug it in there. The only thing is my radio came really low battery. And there is a charger with it, but I was using kind of my normal high power charger that I use for Samsung tablets and stuff, and it wasn't charging. I had to find the really high power USB 3 charger that I use for my little USB soldering iron and that was the only thing that would actually get it charging. Once charging the little lights at the bottom flash and uh, once it's fully charged press the 
button once hopefully you can see all the four lights are on once it's fully charged then press the button once press and hold it to power up the radio once it's powered plug the usb cable in the bottom into the computer and again activate and go through the firmware update and it's done Next job then is to actually pair the goggles and the airside unit and the radio together. Again, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are some little holes both on the airside unit and the underside of the goggles and you have to press that in. Uh, I would use a little paper clip or something like that. Uh, just press it in briefly, you'll feel it click and that will put it into bind mode. Do the goggles first and then when they're beeping away uh, with the airside unit powered up as well, click the little button in there It'll take a second, there'll be a confirmation tone, and the image will appear in your goggles. That's all done. With the radio, it's the same process, but there isn't a little button that you press to get it all to work. What you have to do is, once it's powered up, to put it into bind mode, you press and hold the bind button, you press and hold the record button, and you press in the rotating switch here. So you press those three things. Again, it'll start to beep, and you press the button on the airside unit. For me, I had a bit of a problem with this. I had to put the airside unit into bind first, then put the radio, or sorry, the controller, FPV controller, into bind, and then it bound up straight away. You know it's bound because the little LED by the side of the power lights goes green, and similarly goes green on the air unit, and everything works. Once this is paired with the air unit, you will then also get a uh, radio RSSI indicator in the bottom left-hand corner of your goggles. And then once you've got it all set up, you, once it's all powered, you're ready to go. So with it all activated and set up and paired, you are ready to go. Um, all the control is really done from the goggles using this five-way joystick and the back button and you, there's a little record button here that you can set the recording in the goggles through the menu system you can decide whether you want to record just on the SD card here on the goggles or the airside unit or both and in what format you want to record them. Uh, the setup of the radio is also in the goggles as well. Uh, the entire system talks together so that when you want to change things on the radio uh, you kind of do it. You can either enter the controller options here automatically or briefly pressing in the rotating control on the radio will bring up the menu in here and you can set it up to how you want. It is a very, very integrated system and uh, the, you don't have to use one of these radios. You could just use a regular FreeSky Tyrannus or something else, uh, but then you don't have the RSSI information coming into your goggles. Again, one of those little twists uh, that make it feel slightly less open than some of the other potential options that we have for HD. So let me talk about some of the tips, tricks, and mods for those of you that have got to that point and have been trying and flying it and kind of want to know uh, what I've done. Well, uh, apart from getting hold of the new foam, so it actually fits your face properly, as I've kind of shown, you can get these kind of little shims um, I've got a couple of sets in here. They're not brilliant, to be honest. If you're going to do it, get the proper face foam. Um, you will spend about the same amount of money buying a couple of lots of these, try and find something. These are kind of 3D printed uh, soft um, things with double-sided foam on the back, and they're terrible. Um, just if you going to get these check with the vendor whether or not it's got the other face foam in if it doesn't order it with the kit other thing you're going to need to get hold of is a case now as i showed in the unboxing there is a bag that it comes with it's very disappointing that you don't get any kind of hard case that come with these uh, these are not cheap and um, i have got myself a case here uh, there's loads of different options around. This just happens to be the one. Uh, it fits in with the antennas. There's room at the top for the other cables. And it means that when you're transporting everything, it isn't going to get damaged. Similarly, with the radio, uh, there's no gimbal protectors in the box. There's no kind of bag. So, um, again, it's DJI's kind of business model, isn't it? Where you buy the stuff and then you have to spend more money buying the case. And that uh, is something to be said for Fat Shark. At least when you buy that kind of stuff, you do get the case with it. You can change the region on the goggles. Now, when you activate it, it's going to set the region to whereabouts in the world you are, and that will change the power levels 
and the number of channels that you have available. Again, in the UK, that's going to limit you, I think, to four channels, 25 milliwatts, and that's only going to be good up to about 0.7 of a kilometre away. Now, there is this detail here. I need to say a fantastic thank you to a gentleman called Mad Angler one on RC Groups who kind of posted this stuff. It's relatively easy to change the region once you've got it set up. Uh, on the SD card that you have in the air unit, you need to create a neko.txt file and you need to put the contents of the, which particular region you're interested in. Um, I'm going to put a link down below and you can just download the NACO.txt file, uh, which will unlock it to region one. Again, uh, be very careful with this. It will allow you to access frequencies that are not legal in your country and access power levels that aren't legal as well. But it does mean that maybe if you registered here in the UK and then you went to somewhere like America uh, using this uh, slide and also uh, knowing that the NACO.txt file is in there uh, that you can actually change it. Be careful with this. Um, remove that card with that file in it when you are connecting the air unit back to the DJI assistant to update and do firmware updates. Uh, it'll just confuse everything and uh, it's just easier to just pop the SD card out if you're doing this to avoid any problems. Last couple of things to comment on here. Again, if you want slightly better range or reception and you are using patch antennas on analog goggles, then you can replace these two lower antennas with left-hand circular polarized patch antennas. Uh, again, uh, I'll put a link in the description for the Menace RC kit that you can do. Uh, it'll give you much more sensitivity on these two receiving antennas. Um, and I wouldn't change at the moment these two antennas at the top that both transmit and receive. The only other thing that I've got in here is this thing from URUAV. This is the DJI digital FPV analog port that you can screw into the side of the goggles and then you can plug in a regular module into here. So something like your Immersion RC or your TBS or whatever it is. And that will then allow you to view analog video in the goggles. However, personally, I still like to use my Fat Sharks for analog and keep these for digital HD FPV. Links to both the Menace RC patches and this thing in the description below. And the last thing is just to mention that there are going to be other HD systems available. Now I played with the Connex system uh, a couple of years ago now. That was one of the first uh, wide scale commercial available HD systems that were about. Um, and it was okay. Uh, this is light years ahead of what the Connex system was. Now the Connex system, the big thing going for that was that you didn't have to buy more goggles. You could plug the Connex receiver into the HDMI input in your existing fat sharks or whatever analog goggles that you had. And that I think is the downside of this, is that if you already like me, have maybe 20 or 30 models that all have analog FPV on, uh, it gets very expensive to try and upgrade each of these with the airside units being about 170 pounds a piece. But there are things like Bite Frost that are coming that I have been beta testing here, which is a far more complementary system, which again has a module that plugs into the goggles. So you don't have to re completely replace the goggles that you've already invested in uh, if you are uh, a big analog pilot. So stay tuned. I will be doing more videos on that once it's out. There's no point in doing videos on DJI and Bite Frost at the moment because Bite Frost is a system that is in test really and until the final version comes out there's no point in doing a comparison but i like the idea that the bike frost system is complementary to us analog pilots because at the moment if i go to the field i have to take all of this stuff if i want to try the hd and i also have to then take a whole not a lot of stuff with another set of fat shark goggles my tyrannus and everything else if i want to fly analog um, and it's just starting to get a little bit too much to uh, to kind of lug around it would be great if it was just like an a, an a unit that could either clip into onto goggles or in my top pocket or whatever that would allow me the option to have hd as well as analog at the field so if there's anything that you would like to know about this stuff or uh, that maybe hasn't been clear in or contradictory in other stuff that you've seen in videos from reviewers then please pop that comment and question down below and I can always make another supplementary video if there's enough interest to talk about those specific things.
Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the inner circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to or for Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject, starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.